Okay, so little ad man. So this is week seven. Week eight, which is the last class, will be next uh, Tuesday. And that will cover kind of a recap of all we've covered. And I go into the psychological piece of retirement, which personally I find more difficult than the financial piece, right? Because what we don't want to be is retired and miserable, right? Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to be sitting around with their twiddling their thumbs. So the idea is that uh, we can reinvent ourselves. And I'll talk about that more next week. Okay, so tonight's class is dealing with the home and taxes. And it's, it's kind of all over the place in the sense that we all have unique situations. So as we go through this, feel free to ask questions. But I want everyone to be thinking about if you own a home, and many people do, you know, what are you gonna do with that home when you retire? And how are you going to reduce your tax burden heading into and living in retirement? So what about that home? So in this case, you know, what are you gonna do with the equity that's been built up over that home? Over time, you know, you've built up this chunk of money, I call it money in the walls of the home. Are you gonna keep it there? Are you gonna do something with it? Are you gonna stay put? You're gonna make somebody pull you out in a body bag, right? Or drag you out if necessary? Because some people, that's their goal. Anybody, is that a goal of anybody in here? Yeah, that's okay. That, that's okay. It's probably my goal too, to be honest with you. Uh, so that's fine, but have a backup plan just in case. So are you going to buy another place? Right? So for some people, they have a big home that they've raised children in. All of a sudden the kids are gone and the home seems too big or it's too much to maintain. So they end up deciding they're gonna to transition to do another kind of place, maybe a condo, maybe a smaller home, maybe even a place like the Western Home or one of the other uh, communities that uh, bring you in and walk you through that process. Uh, you can rent. So don't discount that option. I think a lot of people have this mindset, which is, well, you gotta buy. I mean, renting is throwing money down a gut. No, it's not. Renting can be exactly the right thing to do. And I'll give you an example here. I was helping a couple. Sadly, I was helping them after the fact. Uh, they decided to retire to Arizona. I don't know why they'd want to get out of here in the wintertime, but they, they chose to, right? Well, they bought a home. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but it gets hot as hell in the summertime in Arizona. And after one year, of telling friends and family to come visit them, and they didn't, uh, they sold their house and they moved back. You don't wanna do that. You don't wanna do, because of course they lost a lot of money in that process of buying and selling that whole process. So what they should have done in that situation was to rent, rent for a year or two, figure out if that's the right place for them. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But if you're renting, boom, you can get the hell out of there and move on to some other place that you think will be a better fit for you. So staying put, right? Let's say you're the kind of person you're gonna stay put in that home. So some people will try to make money off you. Don't fall for that. We're talking the, the reverse mortgage. You see all the commercials on television, I'm sure most of you do, right? If they're spending thousands and thousands of dollars pushing a reverse mortgage, who's making the money? right? They're making money off of people. A lot of times they're laden with high fees. So it could be an option. I'm not saying you shouldn't consider a reverse mortgage, but I would make it the last option. The last place you go to access money, meaning you've run out of the rest of the money. Otherwise, you know, try to avoid this option simply because of the high fees. And if you do get a reverse mortgage, make sure you shop around for the lenders to do that. Because basically the idea with the reverse mortgage, the mortgage pays you as you retire in the home. Avoid home equity loans. Again, paying interest on your home at this stage of your life, it makes no sense. I wouldn't do it. And don't let lenders try to sell you on this idea. Because of course, they're happy to pay, to earn interest on the loan that they're gonna give you. 
So, you know, try to be cognizant of that. And of course, avoid those slick talking salespeople. And a lot of them are on television. A lot of them are on there pitching and some of them are celebrities, you know. Uh, again, these people don't work for free. They're not Mother Teresa. They're getting paid big bucks to push a product that makes a lot of money for other people, generally those lenders. So now let's say you're selling it and you're gonna buy another home, right? And a lot of people do. Now that home could be a condo, it could be some other place. So what are you gonna do with the equity? So one, make sure you know this, if you sell your house, a single individual can make up to $250,000 of profit without paying any income tax, none. A joint, a couple filing a joint return can make up to 500,000. Again, make that amount. So somebody sells their home for $600,000 and they had purchased that home for 300,000. Well, they made $300,000, right? Tax-free. So then you take that money and let's see what you do with it. Any questions on that? Because that's key know that you can make a big profit tax-free when selling a personal residence. Not a rental property, but a personal place that you've lived in for two years out of the last five. That was your personal home. So with low interest rates, you could consider putting down 20% on a 15-year loan. You could. Because that will avoid PMI, private mortgage insurance, by putting 20% down interest rates climb, you could consider paying it off in full. In other words, you buy it with cash. Again, I'm not here to say you should do one or the other. I want you to know that you have choices. You have options because these decisions, in case you're wondering, are huge. You, you could be dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you really want to make sure you know your options and you're trying to make the very best decision with this chunk of money. Just pause and think carefully because you want to make sure that when you look back, you realize you made the right decision because you considered all of your options. So here's an example. Somebody has $300,000 of equity, right? They, they made, they pulled 300,000 out of it. And they decide to buy a $200,000 home. It could be a condo, home, whatever. They're asking them these questions themselves. like. What am I gonna do? Am I gonna just chunk it all down? Am I gonna do partly? So in this case, let's say somebody takes out a 30 year loan, say environments, it's 4.75 interest on a, 50, on a 30, 15 year loan is gonna be lower. And then an adjustable rate loan could be even lower. So why would you consider an adjustable rate loan? Well, because maybe you pay it off in five years. That five year adjustable rate, let's say it stays for five years, and then it has a balloon payment and it readjusts to a new interest rate. Well, you don't care. You got the cash. If it adjusts to a lower rate, then you might continue another loan. If it adjusts to a higher rate, you might take the money out of your portfolio and just plunk it down on the home. So again, take the time to understand that those options are there. You're generally gonna get the lowest rate with an adjustable rate loan, the teaser rate. They're trying to tease you into that loan because generally speaking you stay in that for a long period of time lenders gonna make more money so consider all those options make sure you know in your own mind you know what options gonna be best for you there are times that you make a smart financial decision and there are times you make a smart psychological decision so what I mean by that you may have the money you may have a low interest rate environment you may feel like I could take out a loan at say 3%, but I feel better just getting rid of any kind of loan. I wanna be in retirement with no debt. Does anybody else feel that way? It's okay, then, then do it. Then pay it off and have no debt. I, I get it. So psychologically, it's gonna feel good. You're gonna feel good about that. Financially, you might have done better because of opportunity cost where money was working instead of in the house in your investment portfolio, right? If you're paying three and a half percent on a loan 
for a mortgage and you pay it off, well, you made three and a half percent. Think of it that way. If that money was in a portfolio earning 7%, let's say, well, you've doubled your return. And again, so we, we consider opportunity costs. We look at the financial move, but we can certainly understand the psychological move. And if it, pay, if it makes you feel better about where you're at in your life to just get rid of the loan, I don't blame you. But at least realize that you're coming at it as informed as you can. Okay, so option one, we put the entire 200,000 down on the house. You invest the remaining $100,000. So we pulled that 300 out. We still have an extra 100, what are we gonna do with it? Uh, option two, you just put 20% down. So you put 40,000 down and you invest 260,000. That's another option. Option three, you put it down on that 15 year loan at a lower interest rate. Option four, put it down on that adjustable rate, five year mortgage. At the end of five years as a balloon payment, well, so what? You may end up just paying it off or you may have another loan. Those options will almost always be there for you. When you got money, you have options. When you're lacking in money, you're at the mercy of lenders. So put yourself in the position of the person who's in charge. Don't let the lenders be in charge. So now let's say you wanna sell and you're gonna rent for a while. Who knows how long, but in your mind, you're not quite ready to buy because you're not sure if you're gonna stay put. Uh, here's an, <laughs> I, this isn't so anecdotal. I think this happens more times than people wanna admit. I uh, had a lady who, she was gonna move near her daughter, right? Her daughter lived in some place. So she sells her house, she goes and buys a house near her daughter, and then within about 18 months, her daughter and her husband move. Like, mom just moved here to be with you and you just left mom. So be, be mindful of that, that can happen. So again, if that person would have rented, she could have said, okay, I'm gonna maybe follow my daughter or I'm not sure if I'm following her again because she's probably gonna move again, right? But at least in your mind, you have more flexibility if you rent. You take that whole amount of money and you invest it, increasing the size of the portfolio. So it allows you to be mobile, allows you to be flexible. And again, you can buy a home later. I'm not saying you should rent and never buy another home. I'm saying renting can be a decent option until you really get a clear idea of what it is this next version of your life's gonna look like. So investing that large chunk of money, or it could be an inheritance. So we're talking about that equity in a home, right? But some people will receive a large chunk of money a uh, parent passes away, a rich uncle, who knows? All of a sudden, a chunk of money comes in. What do you do with it? You can apply the same strategy to that situation. So first, of course, identify where you are. We've had this discussion on investments, putting together a portfolio with the lowest possible cost, having the right amount in stocks and bonds and cash. If you have money outside of retirement, which is where this money is going to be, so you can't you know, take $200,000 and stick it in an IRA, for example. Not gonna work. You have to put that in a brokerage account outside of retirement. So if that money is gonna be outside of retirement, you want it working as tax efficiently as you can get it. So focus on those costs and focus on tax efficiency, meaning for a stock fund, you want very low turnover. What is low turnover? Less than 10%. So low turnover simply means there's very little buying and selling going on within the fund. So for example, the total stock market index fund at Vanguard has a 4% turnover rate, which is great. Total international stock index fund at Vanguard, 4% turnover rate, it's great. Single digits is what you want. The more turnover, the more you're gonna pay in yearly taxes on those non-retirement accounts. So I've come across this often and uh, 
some of you will deal with this. So let's say you got a chunk of money, 200,000, whatever. It could be 50,000. And you're nervous about putting it in the market all at once, right? Okay, it's okay. Now, would I recommend you just put it in based off your what you want your asset allocation? To, yes, I would recommend that. The history shows that that's a smart move. But for some people, it's a little scary to say, oh, I'm just gonna stick 200,000 in the market. And so, you could dollar cost average it out over 12, even maybe as much as 24 months. So you, you take that 200,000, you put a certain amount every month, come hell or high water, you don't try to time the market, you're just putting it in until all of that money gets in the market. So for some people, it reduces the stress of dealing with such a large chunk of money. You get it in there gradually. Any questions on that? Because that will apply to Many people. Now, how many people would be nervous about putting, let's say, $200,000 into the market? Okay, so that's a fair statement. Keep in mind, when we say in the market, right? Well, you're doing it in relation to your asset allocation. So if your asset allocation, let's say, is 60% stocks and 40% bonds, well, you would take that 200,000, and I have an example of putting it in 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Okay. So investing the excess, right? Option one has you buying stocks and bonds and cash based on your particular asset allocation desires. Put that money in tax efficient index funds. In other words, one option is to put all of that money in stocks. Now, some of you might think, oh, hell, Finley, why in the hell would I do that? Because you don't need it. You don't need it. So, you got, you, you've had this plan, you've got enough money to take care of your needs, and all of a sudden you've got, whatever, $200,000. Well, you can put it all in stocks because that money is earmarked for your heirs or for some organization that you're gonna give it to when you pass away. So it doesn't matter whether stocks go down in the short term, you're investing for the long term because you, in your mind, you don't need that money. So that's one example of why someone would consider taking all of this excess money and sticking in stocks, even though it's gonna make their portfolio stock heavy, it's probably not even for them. So again, that's why you have to look at your particular situation to decide these options. Placing the excess in tax-free municipal bonds. So you might decide to put them in a bond fund. It's called, uh, Vanguard has a tax-exempt intermediate term bond fund that pays no federal income tax. So when you earn interest on a monthly basis, and that fund is paying 2.09 right now, interest for the year, uh, you'll pay no federal income tax, you will pay state income tax on your earnings. So let's say you're in a situation where you are gonna need that money, you really don't wanna take more risk, well you could stick it in an intermediate term bond fund to earn money tax-free at the federal level. And then option four is to put all that money in a money market. You could do that, but you know, why? Why, right? Because again, right, it's like, oh, but it's gonna be safe. Oh, safe from what, right? Inflation's gonna kind of eat it up. Uh, and again, I, I'm not here to say you should put all your money in stocks and you have to look at your situation, but you know, sticking all of this chunk of money in a money market or a bank, a bank paying 0.04 or whatever, right? Um, now the bank will be thankful. I'm sure you'll get a thank you note from them, but you know, what is going to serve you best for years to come? So outside retirement accounts, stock index funds, those two stock funds I talked about, very low turnover. So if you're looking to put money a chunk of money in stocks outside of retirement, those two funds will serve you very well, very well. Total stock owns the entire US economy. Total international stock owns all the stocks outside the US. So those two funds, you own stocks all over the globe. Bond fund, there's that intermediate term tax exempt bond fund that I talked about. Municipal bonds through 
nonprofits that you make money. And is there a little bit of risk there? Yes. It's not a huge risk. They're all high quality bonds. They're rated high quality, but there's going to be some risk of that going down. The value of the bonds going down. You're still going to get your yearly interest of 2% or so, but the value can go down. And then that money market, Vanguard prime money market's paying 2.47% compounded right now. So that's cash. It's going to be fine. It's not going to go down in value, but the interest rate can go down. If the Fed drops rates, that interest rate's going to be following the Fed one way or the other. Bottom line, create a plan. Get a plan. Think about how you're going to deal with this. And you know, I, I'm going to say something that I think should be obvious, but from my experience, it doesn't always happen. If you're married, you should have this conversation. What is your spouse supposed to do with the home if you kick the bucket? Right? I mean, you know, that's a big decision. And if you, if you didn't have that conversation, the spouse is stuck trying to figure shit out after the fact. Not good. So we should have this, this conversation so we, we have a plan before that day comes on whatever happens. So there's an example of home sale and then rent, right? So you decide that you're gonna rent and in this case, you pull out 320,000 of equity, tax-free. What are you gonna do with it? Well, in this case, you add that to the portfolio. So if if your desired allocations are 60% stocks, 40% bonds, and it's currently at 400,000, that's where you are, you add this 320 to it. So you're adding that much money to stocks and that much money to bonds to get you at about a 60-40 split. So when we talk about putting money in the market all at once, that's what we're talking about. It's simply putting it in the desired allocations that you want. Now, can, by the way, at this point, can you get lucky? Yeah, what I mean by lucky. Markets zoom up, and you're thinking, man, am I a genius or what? Right? Well, the opposite can happen. Markets can go down. It's like, oh, my God, I'm an idiot. What did I do? I should have had that money in cash. Right? Don't do that to yourself. Nobody knows what the market's going to do tomorrow, next week, whatever. We don't know. Uh, the reason I, I prefer this method, this method has worked for people over time. Again, what is your desired allocations? Take this big chunk of money and break them up into those desired allocations. And there's your bonds. So you're adding to the stocks, you're adding to the bonds. So once you're all done, you're still at your 60-40 allocation. Now, this process can be a little stressful. Matter of fact, there's probably a couple of you stressing it right now and you're not even doing it. <laughs> and I get it, I get it. So we have some, I'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. First of all, questions on the home. So before we move to taxes, and I know everybody loves talking about taxes, uh, what questions do you have about the home process that is relatable to you or something you've heard? Anything and anything. Looks like a pretty simple thing. Okay, let's move on to taxes. So identify a tax plan, a tax plan. I, ask, I tell people this and they say, well, yeah, my tax plan is I wanna pay less tax, right? I get that, we all wanna pay less tax. Well, how are you going to go about doing that? So understand how each account is taxed, each account. Do you have an IRA? Do you have a Roth IRA? Do you have a brokerage account that's being taxed at capital gains rate? So be strategic in pulling money out. So in retirement, you're gonna have to pull some money out once you hit 70 and a half, but you're gonna have choices to make throughout retirement. 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, maybe 50s for some of you. When you pull money out, you should have a plan on where it's coming and why. Could consider an accountant. There's nothing wrong with an accountant to help you, but they better help you, right? If, if your accountant is just doing your taxes, 
I find a different accountant. You, if you're going to pay somebody decent money for taxes, make sure they're providing tax guidance to help you reduce your tax bill, not just here. Here's your form. Don't let the tail wag the dog. Big deal. And I see this quite a bit. So uh, there are people that, man, I don't want to pay tax. I hate taxes. Okay. Well, some of those people make poor decisions elsewhere because they're not going to pay tax. Okay, so don't let taxes be the number one priority when pulling money out. That should be part of the process. It shouldn't be the number one thing and only that. Because you could end up making poor decisions with your portfolio because you're so focused on taxes. Think about it carefully. The tax situation in relation to the accounts you're pulling out of, stocks, bonds, cash, and how it's being taxed. So Social Security and taxes, before I go to that, I'd like to go to a, a, a spreadsheet here. Help me out with the spreadsheet. Yes. Just expand that. So this may be a little hard for you to see. Uh, if you like, I'll send this to you. Send me an email. I'll send the spreadsheet to you. This is the 2019 tax brackets. Also covers capital gains. Key points, earned income, passive income. So when you start to, you're going through work years, you're paying taxes, marginal brackets, when you're in retirement, you're gonna to start to maybe have some capital gains that are being taxed based on non-retirement accounts. So, I like this on purpose. If you can keep your income under these amounts for joint, head, household, single, and you pull money out of non-retirement accounts with long-term capital gains, staying under those amounts that you see in red, you will pay zero tax. Long-term capital gains. How do you get long-term capital gains? That total stock market index fund, total international stock index fund. They're going to get you long-term gains because there's very little selling. So the security has to be held for more than a year. That's what's going to happen inside those funds. So anything you have outside of retirement and stocks, you want to get as much long-term capital gains as possible. Because in this case, even if you're in a higher tax bracket, you're still only paying a 15% capital gains in most cases. And if you can squeeze under 12%, you're down to nothing. So that's why we own index stock funds outside of retirement instead of managed funds, which tend to have a lot of short-term capital gains because they do a lot of buying and selling. And you'll see those rates are the same as the brackets over there. Short-term capital gains, don't help you. You might as well have made money because you're going to get taxed on it. Now, you're not going to get FICA tax, Social Security and Medicare, but you're going to get everything else. You're going to pay higher tax owning a managed fund that does a lot of buying and selling because they're incurring a lot of short-term capital gains and ordinary in, uh, dividends. You want to incur long-term capital gains and qualified dividends, and you're going to get them inside stock index funds, specifically that total stock, international stock. Yes, sir. It does. So when you, so great example. So let's say you're a married couple and you have 90,000 coming in. You made 90,000. If you pull 13,000 in long-term capital gains, 90 plus 13 is 103. You're under that threshold that 13,000 will be tax-free, zero, right? If some of that goes above 103, let's say you had 20,000 long-term capital gains, well, then about 7,000 of it is gonna be taxed at a 15% rate because you've gone beyond that bracket. So yes, the capital gains added to all of your other income, either staying below that threshold or jumping you above. 
And we're going to talk about some other strategies as well. So I think it's wise to take some time and review this. So again, feel free to reach out to me. I'll send it to you. Understand the tax bracket. Now, do these change? Sure, they change. They've, they've changed within the last couple of years. But by understanding them, you can better prepare a tax strategy in reducing them in retirement. You bet. So your pension money, you know, it's, it's going to come, it's going to be taxed as regular income. It's not going to be taxed at FICA, no, no Social Security or Medicare taxes, but otherwise you're going to pay tax on that. And then that's going to put you in whatever bracket. If you pull money from an IRA, it's going to put you within that marginal bracket. And then capital gains added to that will either keep you in a certain bracket or knock you to a higher bracket. So you're considering all of this income as you're considering investing in non-retirement accounts with a large chunk of money. So I've done this for you. So bear with me. What you see out there on the internet, you're not going to see this because this is what you're actually tax rate. So the, the bracket you see on the internet, that, if you read carefully, that's taxable income. So they don't even show that line in blue. They don't show it. They assume you know that. Well, I want you to know it and I want you to see it. So a married couple can make $24,400 in 2019 and pay no federal income tax. Married person, 12,200, uh, single person, right? Anything above that, you pay a 10% BRAC tax and then 12 and you keep going from there. So if somebody made $100,000, a portion of that money would be taxed at 12%, a portion of it would be taxed at 10%, and 24,400 would be taxed nothing. That's correct. So this counts the standard deduction. It does not count if you have itemized deductions. But here's the truth. Most people will not be itemizing. Most people, especially in retirement, you're not gonna be itemizing is very, very unlikely. To itemize as a married couple, you have to have itemized deductions above $24,400 for that to make any impact at all. And for most people, that's not gonna happen. So are there other deductions? Possibly, yeah. And we'll talk about some deductions at the state level with uh, retirement money. Any other questions on this particular spreadsheet? Yes, sir. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Could be, yep. Okay, so we could take that down, please, and we'll put the PowerPoint back up. So, Social Security and taxes. How does Social Security get taxed? Well, right, some of it can be taxed at nothing. 50% of it could be taxed, or 85% of your benefit can be taxed, right? You're not taxed at that rate. So we've talked about that a little bit during our Social Security Week. What's most important is that's at the federal level. So provisional income, other money coming in will have an impact on whether or not your Social Security benefit is going to be taxed. So other money is pretty much everything except Roth money. So if you've noticed a theme over the last few weeks, you want to get yourself some Roth money. Roth IRAs will help you reduce your taxes in the future. They'll help quite possibly reduce your premiums on your Part B and your Part D for Medicare. They can reduce your RMDs because money's in a Roth instead of pre-tax traditional. So there's a lot of benefits to having Roth money if you can within your situation. So there's no taxation Social Security in Iowa. So good news, right? You don't pay tax on that at all. Uh, you want to look, if you're going to retire somewhere, how do they tax Social Security, right? You want to look at that because that's going to change. Every state is unique. Some have no state income tax. Some states will tax it in full. So anybody going to retire in Minnesota? Okay, good call. So they're, they're going to tax you in full for your Social Security benefit in Minnesota. So I'm 
trying to figure out why they would do that. Seems like uh, if you got people who live in a cold state, you should be trying to find ways to motivate them to stay there, but I don't know. Federal income tax withholding. So those are the withholding rates that you could select on your Social Security benefit. Four different ones. And so you would choose the ones that fit your particular situation. So what I would tell you is for most of you, seven or 10 should do just fine. So again, withholding just like your paycheck at work. You have so much withheld because at the end of the year, you do your taxes and you pay whatever you think you are gonna owe based off that income. Pensions. How does pensions get taxed, right? This includes IPERS, right? Many of you have IPERS. So ordinary income. So it's gonna be taxed just like you made money from a job, except you won't be paying FICA. So 7.65%, which comes out for Social Security and Medicare, will not come out of this benefit. There is an exemption of $6,000 for a single person, $12,000 for a joint, for a couple, in Iowa, meaning you, let's say a couple, they pull $12,000 out of their IRA for the year, or it could come from IPERS. Well, that first $12,000 is tax exempt. You'll pay no tax on that in the state of Iowa. Still pay tax on it for federal, but Iowa gives you that exemption, single and married, for all retirement money, all retirement money coming in, pensions, IRAs, whatever, and that's per year. Roth conversion. So, nice little trick. You're, you're, you got whatever. You're living on other kinds of money. Maybe you're living on non-retirement money. Who knows? Maybe you're living on uh, the equity of a home or an inheritance. So you're not actually pulling any IRA money. None, right? You could convert. Let's say you're a... Uh, a single person, you could take $6,000 of IRA money, convert it to a Roth, and you'll get a tax deduction of $6,000 from the state. So you won't pay any tax on that $6,000 because that counts towards that personal exemption for the state of Iowa. That would be a uh, retirement withdrawal, and again, up to $6,000 for a single person, up to $12,000 for a couple by doing a Roth conversion, right? Because you have no other retirement money coming in. And the reason you would do that is, you're not gonna be taxed on it at state level, like none. So, and you're moving some money into a Roth, which is gonna help you come 70 and a half and beyond with the required minimum distribution. Yes, ma'am. There you go, age 55 is exactly right. So if you're pulling IRA money at 52, that exemption does not affect you until you're 55. But the good news is if you're retiring at 52, hey, you did something right. So all passive income, all passive income, no FICA income tax. So just kind of the back of your mind, remember that. So you are saving money as you're pulling out some of this retirement money in taxes when it comes to Social Security. And identify your tax withholding on retirement accounts. So whether that's IPERS, it's an IRA, I would tell you in most cases, for most people, average people in Iowa, a 10% federal withholding, 5% state should serve your needs quite well. Now, if your accountant says, no, you need to do 15, okay, that's fine. But again, don't withhold any more than you have to and try not to withhold any less. Uh, generally speaking, a good rule of thumb, a goal would be to break even. Try not to owe, try not to get a big refund. And so you're trying to do that with your withholding on your accounts per year. So withdrawing from investments and taxes. So taxable accounts, right? This is a review. Capital gains rate is 0% in the 10 and 12% marginal tax brackets. 
So you pay nothing in capital gains tax if you sell that and you stay within those brackets. Pre-tax retirement accounts, so IRAs, 401ks, right? You, you pay income taxes like it was a job, but no FICA. Roth accounts, so that money went in after tax. When you pull it out later and it's five years old, so all the earnings are qualified, meaning they're tax-free if the account is five years old. So an account that's five years old. You started a Roth IRA in September of 2016. So the beginning date is 1 January 2016. Your five-year period ends 1 January 2021. So the qualifying period is 1 January of the first year that you started a Roth IRA. Life insurance products, so annuities, whole life, basically all that crap, it's gonna be taxed at normal income rates. So there's no tax benefit when pulling from life insurance products. And here I'm talking about qualified annuities. So if you have an annuity, is it qualified or is it non-qualified? So qualified pre-tax, money went in before tax. Non-qualified money went in after tax. So when you're receiving non-qualified annuity money, some of it may be taxed, some of it may not be taxed, right? The money that first comes to you is generally gonna be taxed and then you'll get to the principal that you put in initially. So if you have an annuity, make sure you know whether it's qualified or non-qualified. RMDs, okay, so <laughs> a lot of people don't like these things. So it's good to understand them and have a strategy on how to deal with them. So at 70 and a half, you have to start pulling money out of your pre-tax retirement accounts. 70 and a half, well, if you're born before one July of that year, you'll be 70 and a half that year. If you turn 70, let's say on one September, you will not be 70 and a half in that year. So you don't need to pull an RMD. You'll be 70 and a half, whatever, the next February or something. So it's the year in which you turn 70 and a half, you need to start taking RMDs. So the good news is, if you keep your money at Vanguard, they'll track it for you. They'll tell you how much that you need to take out. They'll ask you if you wanna do it in monthly payments or once a year, and you can set it up automatic. I would recommend you set up an automatic somehow, wherever you're at, because there's a 50% penalty if you don't. 50, five zero. So you wanna make sure you do that. And by the way, that first year is gonna be about 4%. So take your number, whatever that is. So if somebody had a million dollars in pre-tax money, 4%, 40,000 bucks. You're gonna to have to take out $40,000 because the government wants their tax money. Social Security benefits, it can affect them because all of a sudden you're adding 40,000 of provisional income into your social security benefits that could make them taxable again at 50% of the benefit or maybe as high as 85%. Planning ahead, planning ahead to this gentleman's question, you can consider some Roth conversions and pulling money out of pre-tax retirement accounts. We'll talk about that. So reducing your tax bill can help your portfolio last longer. Key, if you can pay less tax and keep more of your money inside your portfolio growing longer, it should grow bigger. So having a tax plan is important. So what to do with those RMDs, right? As I see it, you got four options. Pay tax and you pay the bills with it, right? That's it. You need to pay bills, use that money to pay the bills. Fine enough. You use it to splurge, go have fun. You don't need it to pay the bills, so you wanna have more fun, fine. Use it for fun. You could reinvest it right back into your investment portfolio. So let's say you pulled it out of the total stock market index fund in your IRA. You could reinvest it 
right back into the total stock market index fund in your brokerage account. So you pay the taxes, say you have withholdings of 10% federal, 5% state, and so then 85% of that is going right into a brokerage account into the identical investment because you don't need it. And so it stays within the portfolio minus the tax withholding. So that's an option for people who don't need it to pay the bills and they have enough fun. They don't need more fun. And of course, another option is giving it away. You can give it away. Give it away to organizations, individuals, church, whatever that's important to you. Now, I'm going to say something that, you know, you don't hear that much, but I think it's important. Uh, you know, something doesn't have to be tax deductible to make it worthwhile. You know, I, I've come across people who say, well, if it's not tax deductible, I'm not going to... Why? If you're giving to something that's important to you, what does that matter? Actually, what I would tell you is, it's actually better that it's not tax deductible because you're giving it unconditionally. There's no real benefit to you externally, there is a benefit intrinsically. So I would actually, I believe, that giving to organizations, individuals, whoever, without any benefit to you whatsoever, on the external will actually make it feel so much better. So, my thoughts. So, Roth conversion strategy. Roth conversion strategy. Single person or a couple, doesn't matter. They, uh, they spoke to their accountant and they want to do a Roth conversion with IRA money as long as they can stay within a 12% tax bracket. So, this is uh, case by case. I don't think I would ever do Roth conversions in the 22% tax bracket. Maybe some of you would. I wouldn't. I would defer tax. But if you want to make a case for it and you can look at the whole situation, you're projecting the future, maybe you up that to 20 because it's 10, 12, 22, 24, 32. Those are the brackets. My advice, good rule of thumb is, if you can do Roth conversions within the 12% bracket, you would consider doing that. The accountant tells you, because he's running the taxes, and he tells you exactly, you can put away 8542 inside a Roth account this year. You can convert it. Convert the IRA, that much money, into the Roth. You'll pay tax on it, but that amount adds up to your other income, keeping you within the 12% bracket. So you've gotten it out of the pre-tax money and you moved it into the Roth somewhere, let's say in your 60s. As you're starting to prepare for Medicare, you're starting to prepare for your RMD at 70 and a half, this kind of move is going to help those situations. Sometimes a little, sometimes a lot. So you convert it out of the IRA into the Roth, you pay the tax, and of course, that money will be tax-free, all the money going forward in the Roth. You don't have to ever take it out. It will not affect the premiums for Part B or Part D. It's not going to affect your Social Security is how that's taxed. There are pluses to that strategy. And you could do that any year, right? So starting, let's say, at 59 and a half, and if you're retired and if you're in a lower tax bracket, you could have the accountant give you that number and you might consider those Roth conversions as you age. Any questions on that strategy? Yes, sir. The conversion has to be done during that annual year. It's not like uh, the April 15th thing? Yeah. yeah. So when I pause, that means I'm not 100% sure. I think you can do it later, I think. but. When I'm pausing, don't take that like you yeah, know what the hell I'm talking about, right? Yeah, so I think you can hold, but uh, I would research that. So what he's asking is, right, you can put money in for the previous year up to April 15th for uh, an investment in IRA. Question is, can you do a Roth conversion, let's say in April 10th for the previous year? So, go ahead.
Nope. The, the very beginning, the very beginning. And by the way, the Roth conversion has nothing to do with Roth contributions, right? So somebody who is over 50 years old can put away $7,000 into a Roth this year, right? You can do a Roth conversion of 8,500 as well. You could transfer 29,000 from our shitty Roth somewhere else with high fees into a low cost index fund Roth IRA as well. So those transfers don't affect the contribution. The, the conversion number doesn't affect the contribution rate. Yes, ma'am. No, you, you don't have to be retired. Uh, you do need to be over 59 and a half, right? So you have to be over that to, to make sure there's no penalty. And again, my advice, you gotta be in the 12% bracket. That's why it tends to work for people who are retired or people who might be working in their 60s, but they're not making that much money. That would be a strategy. No? Okay, another strategy. IRA withdrawal strategy. So this is something that happens in your 60s. You're trying to reduce the size of your RMD when you hit 70 and a half, so you get whacked with a whole bunch of money that could affect how Social Security is taxed. So a single person or a couple, you're still trying to stay within that 12% bracket. The accountant tells you you can put away that much money, so you can pull that out of your IRA to pay the bills. That's what I'm saying. In other words, you don't, you put other money, let's say, in a, uh, a non-retirement account. You put other money in a Roth IRA. And you use your IRA money to pay the bills. You're, you're shrinking the IRA accounts, the pre-tax accounts, and maybe you're expanding your non-retirement and your Roth money as you prepare for these years going forward where that pre-tax IRA money is gonna have an impact on these other taxable events. So you withdraw it, you pay the bills with it, you pay taxes as you withdraw it, and then you're, you're left with non-retirement and Roth money going forward. So you have less IRA money and more non-retirement and more Roth. And again, the reason you do that is to help you to reduce taxes on Social Security in the future, reduce taxes on maybe Medicare, Part B and Part D. It could have multiple positive benefits. Questions on that strategy? Okay, that's the truth. I'm 100% I'm sure of that now. <laughs> the end of the year. The end of the year, right? So it does not go to April 15th. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Again, this is a strategy to use when you're in the lower tax brackets and you're trying to reduce the size of retirement accounts that are pre-tax. Because the truth is, folks, for a lot of people, a lot of their money is pre-tax as you're going into retirement. If you can find ways to reduce that effect, you're going to get yourself in a better position from a tax perspective. Yes, sir. There's no penalty. There's four fifty nine dollars for a regular IRA. And this is the question. Before fifty nine dollars can't you convert a regular IRA to a... Correct. Without any penalty? Correct. Okay, just want to make sure. This, this you can't, right? You're actually pulling money out of an IRA to pay bills. So that's where the penalty would take place at 59 and a half before. Uh, the Roth conversion, you can do right now. A 30-year-old can do a Roth conversion right now in pretty much any amount they want. Yep. How do you do So someone has high income. Their income, they're in the 22, 24% tax brackets. So if you do a Roth conversion now, you're paying tax on 22, 24%. I wouldn't do that. Now, maybe some people would, but I would defer that tax. Okay. So this is where <laughs> you talk about all this stuff and you think, good Lord, there's a lot of crap to try to figure out, right? So if you need help, there are people who can help you. And as you've already heard from previous classes, there are a lot of people that should not be helping you. So you want somebody 
who can help you make the moves, right? In other words, let's say you have crappy retirement accounts somewhere and you're trying to consolidate them into one place. Well, somebody can help you with that, some kind of advisor. You want a financial plan, right? You kind of have this hodgepodge stuff and it's all over the place and there isn't really clear, well, a financial plan gives you something that says, okay, these are the steps I'm gonna use as I go into and live into retirement. You want somebody to review your asset allocation. In other words, they review exactly how much you're allocated to, they make sure that you're diversified properly, they make sure you've reduced the cost, they help you through that process because it's confusing to you. That's a fairly decent reason to get some help. For some people, you want somebody to manage your portfolio. So, you know, this is, it starts to get more expensive, right? So this means I can't do it myself or I'm not willing to, so I'm gonna pay somebody a percentage to actually manage my portfolio for me. Now, maybe I do that because I'm an emotional basket case. So my emotions are gonna cause me to make really bad decisions. So I find somebody who's gonna help me through that. Now, I could, could find a, an advisor, I could just find a therapist. But either way, I need to get myself in a position so I'm not making poor emotional decisions. So financial advisor basics, just to understand the difference between fee-based and fee-only, right? They're very close, but they're very, very different. So avoid fee-based advisors. The system is built for them, fee-based. They get paid behind the scenes, they get paid by other parties to pitch products to you. In many cases, those are annuities, uh, insurance products, high cost managed funds. There's all kinds of products out there that make fee-based advisors a lot of money. The reason why most advisors out there are fee-based, because that's where the money's at. There's a lot of money in it. And you know, an easy rule of thumb is, if you're not paying your advisor, you got the wrong advisor. Because he's getting paid by somebody else to push products and services on you that serve them over you. If you need help, look at a fee-only financial advisor. Fee-only. You pay them and nobody else. Right? They're not pitching products. They're not making commissions off some kind of life insurance product that, that like an annuity. Uh, no, They're, you're paying them a fee or maybe money under management, but you're the one paying them. And so they are working for you and you only. That's key. If you need help, you want somebody who is a fiduciary. Their sole responsibility is to do what's best for you over all else. And if they're not a fiduciary, then you should run away from them because that means they don't have to do what's best for you. Now, who wants somebody guiding them who doesn't do what's best for you? That is just crazy. And yet, the vast majority of Americans who have advisors are fee-based. And they're getting screwed, and they just don't know it. So, consider Patty. Patty's here tonight, where are you at, Patty? We'll answer that question in a minute, ma'am. So Patty's here, Patty's a fee-only advisor. She can guide you in simple ways that can help you basically put together all this information. She charges a reasonable fee at $50 an hour. That's as cheap as financial advisors get, I promise you. I've seen advisors charge $500 to $1,000 an hour. So Patty can sit down with you, identify your needs, and figure out what kind of help you need. So she's somebody that I trust, and I think you can trust her too. Contact information's right there. Uh, yes, ma'am, your question. Uh, so what happened was the government tried and they squashed it. It eliminated. So you see, it's gonna sound crazy, but the financial services industry, they didn't want that. And they fought it tooth and nail and it died. So no, they do not have to be a fiduciary. They can do what's called suitability. They give you what's suitable for your situation, which really means they're gonna give you something, but they're number one and you're number two.
Yeah, so one I would ask, and honestly, <laughs> it's real simple. Are you a fiduciary? And if they get well, oh, okay, leave. Okay, leave, right? If they stumble, that tells you all you need to know. Now, if they say, yes, I am, then you start exploring with more questions, okay? Tomorrow night's class uh, for investment class is on financial advisors. So I go into this in more depth in that class at the Waterloo Library. So other advisors locally, Mike Dunlop, he manages money for people, right? So again, uh, you, if you need somebody to, to manage your money, he'll put you in low cost index funds, but he's gonna charge you a money under management fee per year to do that. And you might think, well, I don't need that because I don't think most people do. But some people do. What about mom and dad? What about grandma and grandpa? What about people who cannot manage their money for one reason or another? Who is helping them? Uh, you got Casey Redman. He is a fee-only advisor as well. And what he'll do is he'll put together a financial plan for you. He'll help you with asset allocation, financial planning. But he's going to set it up, and then there you go. He's going to help you put it all together. You're done. Now you're in control of it. Now you can contact him periodically as needed, but he's not going to manage your money. He's just going to get it all put together in a way that suits your situation and your needs and then hand it over. So those are financial advisors locally. I have their cards up here if you'd like to take a look at them. I'm sure Patty will hang around a little bit after class. Uh, take the time to ask questions. Every one of these people will sit down with you with a free consultation. Get an idea. Are you a good fit for them? Do you need help? And if so, what kind of help? Right. So estate planning. Uh, I got news for you. You're all going to die. Okay? We're all going to die. None of us are getting out of this slide. So plan for it. Have those discussions. I recommend putting together a death file. A death file is, is one file that has maybe password information. It has an identif identification of all the statements, where the money's at. It uh, might have a, a written down document telling the family members, this is what, this is what it is, this is where it is at. You, you're basically walking them through this process as they deal with death. In other words, you can make life a lot easier on your loved ones because they're dealing with the emotional piece. You have provided the financial piece. They don't have to go dig around and try to figure out where all your money's at and how to get in there and blah, blah, blah. So a death file can help you do that. And have conversations. And listen, I know some of you, you're gonna, you guys sit down with your daughter, your son. Now, I want to talk about my death. Oh, no. I know. Nobody wants to talk about it. I'd make them. I don't, I don't care how you did it. Lock them in the room. I'd have that conversation. They will benefit through that conversation. Get that will in order. Make sure the will is current. Make sure it, it is your wishes today. Right? So, you know, on occasion, somebody passes away and all the money goes to the ex-wife Whoops, make sure the will is showing exactly who you want the money to go to. Sit down and have that thoughtful conversation with your loved ones. Review beneficiaries, make sure the beneficiaries are current. Make sure they're current on all of your retirement accounts. Do a payable on death on all of your non-retirement accounts. So your brokerage accounts, you do what's called a payable on death certificate. So that pays out kind of like a beneficiary. So POD is on brokerage accounts that are non-retirement. Beneficiaries are on retirement accounts. Primary, secondary, whatever. Yes, ma'am. So when that money comes to them, uh, non-retirement money has what's called a step-up basis. So let's just use an example. Somebody has 200,000 in a non-retirement account and they have a profit of $80,000 in there. They put in 120, they made 80,000, they have 200. When they pass, it steps up in basis. So they're gonna get 200,000 tax-free. 
Okay. That will be that will be an inherited IRA if you're a non-spouse. So if it's a spouse, that IRA would go to the spouse in their name. It becomes their IRA done. Okay. For, if it goes to a son, a daughter, somebody else, it's going to be an inherited IRA. That's the name of the account, and then they're going to select how that gets paid out over time. They're going to have an RMD on that, even if they're 30 years old, based off their actuary table. They could do a five-year payout. They can do a life expectancy payout. They could do cash out and pay a whole lot of tax. So inherited IRAs go to non-spouses, and some of that will be taxed. A Roth IRA will have RMDs too, but they won't pay tax on that. But they'll still have to take it out over periods of time. Okay. Decide if the will is fine or if you need a trust, right? If you need a trust because you maybe have some issues that you want to get, make sure they're resolved upon your death, then you go through the process of getting a trust to make sure that happens. Just keep in mind, you know, it's not cheap. You know, you're going to chuck over $2,000 or so for a trust. So if you feel like your situation is simple, and your family knows exactly what to do with your money, you may not need a trust. A lot of people don't need a trust. Some people do. You have a disabled child. You have a family that likes to squabble and you need somebody to handle things because you're not sure things are gonna get handled nicely and without a lot of complaining. So consider a trust if it's extenuating circumstances. Questions on taxes? Yes, sir. Uh, they're going to be fee only, right? So a fiduciary is they have to do what's best for you above all else. And the problem with fee based, they're getting paid by other people and they really are doing what's best for them and those other people because that's where all the big money's at. So the fiduciary, they ha just like an accountant, just like a doctor, they have to do what's first most important for you, period. And even then, which I'll talk about tomorrow night, somebody could be a fiduciary, a fee-only advisor, and you should still run away from them if they're a poor fee-only advisor. And again, what that means, without going into a lot of detail, is that doesn't mean that they're still going to do what's right for you. Meaning, right? I care about you. I'm going to do what's best for you. Except I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Okay? I can have the best intentions if I make a mess I still made a mess. So you still want to have a good fee-only advisor guiding you to make the correct decisions going forward. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I have an example. <clears throat> I just bought a CD this afternoon. Okay, it was my, my name only. And I was in, in a conversation and I forgot about labeling a POD or anything. I am married at one time. My wife would automatically, something would happen to me, my wife would automatically get me, they would, it would escape COVID and go to my wife. But for my son, I probably should have should put my son on there, POD, because what did that escape COVID? Yes. Yes. I have to go back. And by the way, you, you can allocate different uh, accounts to go to different people, right? It's not like it goes to one person. It's your choice on how you decide how that money is distributed. And then have that conversation, folks, right? So like a non-retirement money, uh, does the son know that has a step-up basis? Well, this is, this is a CD, uh, it's not stock. Um, yeah. yeah. Yep, so anything, anytime you're leaving money to people and it's non-retirement, make sure they know that when they get it upon death, it's gonna be tax-free, right? Uh, know that if money coming in in an IRA, probably not going to be taxed. Uh, life insurance proceeds. Do you pay life and do you pay taxes on a life insurance payout? No. There you go. Good strong answer. The answer is no. In almost all cases, you have to have a huge estate. So somebody passes away and they leave you two hundred thousand dollars, you will not pay tax on that. Now the insurance agent shows up. What do you do? You take the check. Tell him to get away because he's going to try to sell you an annuity. Go, and he's going to try to talk to you. Just shut the door, put it in the bank, deal with death, 
and probably call a fee-only advisor for some help. And I think it's wise to do that. Get those beneficiaries things down and the payable on death down. Figure out what you want, make it happen. Other questions? Okay. So my story tonight is called 25 Days. So anybody who has studied the stock market, and if, if you take the time to understand the history of markets, what we know is about 25 days out of every year, roughly, you make all your money. That's it. Like, if you were not in the market for those 25 days, you wouldn't make jack. You, you would end up having money better off in the bank, earning almost nothing. So you need to be in the market, you need to be in the game for those 25 days, which, by the way, nobody knows when they're coming. Nobody, nobody. It's not like you can say, okay, I, I just wanna sign up for the 25 days. That, that's not how it works, it doesn't work that way, okay? So those 25 days are critically important. That is the difference between having a portfolio that barely feeds you in retirement versus a portfolio that allows you to live comfortably in retirement. So it makes the case for the buy and the hold strategy. You buy and you hold through the good and through the bad. But that's just really giving you a, an idea of the story. What I've also learned in my life is, and I, I truly believe this, is I would tell you there's maybe 25 days out of the year that changes our lives, you know? If, if we reflect back, we, we, can, we can notice that there were certain experiences, certain days, certain people, certain environments that changed the course of our lives. And what I would tell you is, you gotta be in the game to get that. You've gotta be in the game of life. You gotta be, as Theodore Roosevelt would say, you gotta be in the arena, getting muddy, getting dirty, getting beat up, and even failing, but you're in the game. You're not going to achieve those 25 glorious days sitting on the sideline, sitting in a house, watching a television. You've got to be actively involved in life to experience those days. And again, we don't know when those days are coming. We might think we do, but we know when we reflect back. And as I reflect back on my life, I can reflect on that. And what I know is when I was actively involved with life, when I was trying, I was out there to make a difference for myself and the people I cared about, that's when my life changed for the better. And I would tell you, if you keep that in mind and you remind yourself that it's the active person, it's the person who's in the game, that's the person who's going to change their lives and change the lives around them. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you, folks.